Welcome to the MD Edge Daily News for the final day in July. I'm Nick Andrews. Today, alcohol use during breastfeeding is linked to cognitive harm in children. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Also today, fertility and sexual function counseling should start early. And later, despite treatment, those with HIV develop more frailty. But our top story today is a recall of certain Valsartan-containing products. The FDA says that cancer risk associated with NDMA contained in impure Valsartan is definitely real, but it is very low. The agency recently announced a voluntary recall of certain Valsartan-containing products, as well as Valsartan hydrochlorothiazide, due to the presence of NDMA. Valsartan is commonly used to treat high blood pressure and heart failure. NDMA is a semi-volatile organic compound that has been linked to cancer in animal studies, but at levels that are much higher than the impurity levels in the recalled batches. However, the FDA wanted to add context to the actual potential risk posed to patients who used versions of Valsartan that may have contained high levels of NDMA. According to a statement, some levels of the impurity may have been in the Valsartan-containing products for as long as four years. Scientists from the FDA estimate that if 8,000 people took Valsartan daily for the full four years, there may be one additional case of cancer over the lifetimes of those 8,000 people. The agency also says that those patients who are currently taking recalled Valsartan should continue to take the drug until they receive a replacement, and they should follow the recall instructions. You can find links to the recall instructions by clicking the link in the description. Risky or higher alcohol consumption while breastfeeding could be associated with poor cognitive outcomes for children. This is according to results of a longitudinal study published in Pediatrics. In the study, researchers analyzed data from more than 5,000 infants who were followed up with every two years. The researchers also examined other factors, such as information on mother's smoking and drinking habits during breastfeeding. They report a significant link between increased maternal alcohol consumption and decreased nonverbal reasoning scores in children around six years old who had been breastfed at any time. The effect was independent of other factors like prenatal alcohol consumption, age, income, birth weight, head injury, and learning delay. A comparable association was not seen in children who were never breastfed. This supports the suggestion that the cognitive effects were the result of alcohol exposure through breast milk. However, the association was no longer evident in children at 8 to 11 years old. Researchers note that this finding might be attributable to mediation by such factors as increased education. The findings on breastfeeding and cognitive reductions in breastfed infants are consistent with animal studies showing that ethanol in breast milk can affect normal brain development. Children might also experience reduced cognition as a secondary effect of changes in feeding, nutritional intake, and sleep patterns that could themselves affect brain development, leading to behavioral changes that might reduce exposure to enriching stimuli. General pediatricians and subspecialists need to provide early and ongoing counseling about infertility and sexual dysfunction for at-risk patients. This is according to the first-ever clinical report on these issues from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Examples of pediatric populations at risk for infertility or sexual dysfunction include those with certain cancers, genetic disorders, rheumatologic disorders, and diabetes. The report also says that counseling should include discussion of possible management and psychosocial options for patients who have these conditions or who need treatments that might impair their reproductive capacity or sexual functioning. Dr. Nina Nahada is a pediatrician at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Nahada says that the goal is for children to feel safe asking questions because a lack of information could lead to inaccurate beliefs or distress over time and throughout young adulthood. Dr. Nahada and her colleagues list five specific recommendations. One, 
early discussion, starting in infancy, or at the soonest point where the patient could be affected. Two, developmentally sensitive approaches that adjust as patients mature. Three, use of evidence-based interventions and shared decision-making. Four, interdisciplinary team approaches. And five, documentation of discussions for a smooth transition to adult care. And finally today, middle-aged and elderly people infected with HIV are more likely to meet an established definition of frailty than uninfected people of the same age. During four years of follow-up, frailty was significantly linked with an increased incidence of both mortality and the development of new comorbidities. This is according to results of a Dutch perspective study of more than 1,100 people presented at the 22nd Annual International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam. Dr. Emily Verhey is a researcher with the Amsterdam Institute for Global Health and Development. Dr. Verhey says that people living with HIV also showed a significantly increased rate of progression to frailty over the course of four years compared with uninfected people after adjustment for demographic differences. This is despite antiretroviral treatment. In the study, the researchers defined frailty by using criteria that was first introduced back in 2001, which established five characteristics as markers of frailty. Those characteristics are slow gait, low grip strength, a low level of physical activity, self-reported exhaustion, and unintentional weight loss of at least 10 pounds or more during the preceding year. Dr. Verheim reports that the prevalence of people identified as robust at the time they entered the study was about 60% of those without HIV and about 40% of those with HIV. During the four years of follow-up, the rates of progression from a robust state to frailty occurred more than twice as often among people living with HIV compared with those who were unaffected. During follow-up, 276 of all enrollees developed more than 300 comorbidities. The four most common incident comorbidities were hypertension, chronic obstructive lung disease, renal insufficiency, and osteoporosis. These four conditions accounted for about 75% of all incident comorbidities. And that concludes this edition of the MD Edge Daily News. You can find links to these stories in the podcast description. For MD Edge, I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. And I'm Nick Andrews. You can make the daily news a part of your routine. Subscribe today, wherever podcasts are found. <laughs>